California in the name of the United States, fought through that, he was one of the first policemen in San Francisco until the vigilantes had to take over in 1851. Later uh, went filibustering with Walker in Nicaragua and took over that country. Um, came back, was a constable in San Francisco for a while. Came over here for the Silver Rush. He was the first man to lay claim to the land where Carson City's airport and Hot Springs are today. Also had a hay ranch out by Fort Churchill. He was the captain of the Silver City Guards during the Paiute Indian Battle. He uh, was the first man held in the, probably the first man held in the jail in Genoa when they rented Warren Wasson's house to be the jail up there. He caught a horse thief blew his brains out, turned himself into the sheriff. And uh, then he later on went down to Antelope Valley. He was uh, district attorney in uh, Mono County for a while. He was justice of the peace down there for a number of terms. He was Colville's postmaster for 20, 25 years. And uh, when he finally passed away in 1913, when they, they buried him there in Colville, and he's already been forgotten. But yet he was one of those old guys that whose blood was just full of adventure and had more grit in his craw than you can imagine. So we'll take a look at him next one. Have now, we heard it all? Yes, what? Have we heard it all? Oh, gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> nope. Are you going to be showing on the uh, screen? No. Uh -huh. Oh, okay. And unfortunately, during that period of time, you know, there just wasn't many cameras yeah. around here. <laughs> Because if we are to know, can we go on up? That far long up? You're not doing You're just, yeah, she's not going to have anything tonight. Yeah. Okay, so tonight then, Lori Hickey, I guess I don't need to do any introduction there. I mean, if you're not related to her, you came into this valley pretty late. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> well, no, well, the stall words of Cousin Valley, right? <laughs> the, um, she's going to be talking to us about another one of those old forgotten pioneers. Haynes uh, is a guy whose house is still here, his barn is still here, but the memory of him has been long forgotten. <laughs> and so we thought, well, time to share that again. So, Lori, why don't you do that for us? Okay, I'm going to try this without the mic. We'll see how we go. Can you hear me? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> bad, bad, bad. <laughs> okay, I'm going to be talking about James Wallace Hayes. I'm going to call him J.W. Because it's a lot easier than saying James Wallace Haynes every time. So, J.W. was a capitalist entrepreneur, a politician. Um, 
he had the ability to seize an idea probably a little before the time he, he uh, made several fortunes here and in the neighborhood, uh, California here. Um, I could probably talk about him for three hours. Uh, he was a very accomplished fellow, so I'm going to try to go quickly and put this into uh, 45 minutes, so we'll see what happens. He was born uh, 17th of August, 1826, in Stead Stand, Quebec, Canada. Uh, his parents were Benjamin Haynes and Nancy Wallace. That's where the James Wallace Haynes comes from. They were both natives of, natives of Vermont. Um, they married and had their children in Canada and then came to Ohio in 1832. Mr. Haynes had a farm. His son, James J.W., uh, worked on the farm and then went to work as a young man on the Great Lakes as a sailor. And then all of a sudden, 1849, and the gold rush to California came. So like every young man, he was going to California to make his fortune. So he joined a wagon train leaving Ohio and made his way to California. One of the families on the train was the Capos family, Dr. James Capos, and they became very good friends. If you're familiar with the area, Capos Lake. They would go there every summer. Uh, the Capos family. When they arrived in California, they lived in Placerville for a while, and then they lived in Folsom and eventually Oak Grove, California. But every summer, they would go to their summer place up on uh, the pass. And early on, they kind of used it as a way station. And uh, so James, or JW, stayed very good friends with them all of his life. And you'll find out how he came, became very good friends with them a little bit later. Um, the Capos, Dr. Capos, set up shop in Placerville. I'm sure J.W. did a little mind when he first got to California. But he was a little too smart for that and figured out that that was a lot of work for very little money. So he opened a restaurant in Sacramento. This was during the California Gold Rush, remember, lots of people. So he did very, very well but not good enough for J.W., so he sold his restaurant and bought a mercantile, which was a very lucrative business during that time. And usually J.W. had partners. Usually he put up the majority share of the money, and he had partners. He did some of the work, but often his partners did more of the work. Um, he was a real thinker, and he'd move on to another adventure. So. Uh, the store was a very successful mercantile. Of course, you know, old Sacramento, that's where the store was. He was flooded several times. Um, he, uh, 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 you know, probably about every three years they would have a flood. And so the mercantile would be flooded. They'd have to clean everything out and do it all over again. Um, by 1851, he decided he was going to go back for a visit in Ohio. He went back and married his first wife. Uh, her name was Cordelia Frances Luce. They were married December 1851. She was dead by September 1852. Mm -hmm. She died of cholera. So, and many of his friends in Ohio, so he said, mm, I've had enough of this, I'm going back to California. So he returned to California. And uh, by 1854, he was considered one of the ten leading citizens in Sacramento, and he and ten others were asked to go to Benicia and petition the body of government that was running the state to move to Sacramento. Well, they must have been pretty successful because the capital is Sacramento, and the body of government in 1854 moved to Sacramento. So he must have been a pretty good convincer. Um, he was the founder of the Pioneer Society of Sacramento. He was also involved with the Philharmonic Society in Sacramento. He was a member of the fire department, fought three major blazes in Sacramento that practically destroyed the town. One of them destroyed his store. 
1855, he was the marshal of Sacramento. Um, I don't think that was much his forte. I think it was kind of a joke. There was a no nothing party, and they put up his name, and he won. And so um, I don't think it was really what he wanted to do, so he didn't stay sheriff very long. Uh, in 1857, him and Alonzo Cheney bought an 8,000 acre ranch um, near where Elk Grove is today. Um, in 1859, uh, or late 1858, he returned back to Ohio to visit his family. Um, he heard about the silver strike in uh, Virginia City. Well, he packed his bags and headed right back. Uh, I have to admire his ability to sort of think ahead and kind of know what's coming next or what he needed to do to make money. Uh, he must have been hanging around Genoa in 1859 because there was a newspaper article piece where he was sort of in charge of the New Year's dance. Uh, in 1859, and so you wouldn't be involved in the community that way. He picked the floor managers and stuff, unless you were somewhat well known. So I'm figuring he was probably coming back and forth over the hill quite a bit because you just don't say, oh, here's a strange guy in town, he's one of the fellows we're going to put in charge. So he was hanging out here a bit. Um, so in the winter of 1859, I consider this his probably biggest folly. He took 500 head of sheep. Now you know our winters, it's cold right now. We don't have a lot of snow, but this winter, probably, I'm thinking around February, probably after New Year's, maybe the weather here wasn't quite so bad when he was here uh, around Christmas and, and New Year's, but a little bit later it got really bad. And so he drove 500 head of sheep over the mountain and was going to pasture them here in Carson Valley. When he got here, there was three feet of snow. And I can't even imagine, except that they made their way, that many of them, breaking it down to get here. So they were able to eat the tops of the sagebrush. He kept on going for the Carson sink, because thinking farther out he got the less snow, probably find bare ground. No, that wasn't the case. There was a foot of snow on the sink. And they were not really equipped for spending the winter out in the middle of nowhere in Nevada. So the Paiutes took pity on them and built them a shelter and camped with them. Now the Paiutes weren't stupid either because they had all these sheep. And knowing that the wolves and coyotes would probably be taking a toll on them, they knew they would have meat. So they had a nice little camp together. And then Sam Brown, the bad man, it, uh, Henry Van Sickle shot. Okay, he was out there looking for his cows. So Haynes, his partner, Sam Brown, all camped together in this little shelter and the Paiutes right next to them. The only place to get provisions was at Asa Kenyon store, which is in Ragtown, near Fallon. Mr. Kenyon sold everything for a very high price. So they were out there about 60 days never saw the sun, continued to snow a little bit every day. The sheep were able to eat tulies, wheat grass, some brush, so they survived, other than the fact that the coyotes and wolves were doing a toll on them. So after about 60 days, Haynes decided that he had to get back to Sacramento. By this time, he's dead broke, because he spent all his money at Asa Kenyon's. And so, uh, Sam Brown gave him his last $20. And Haynes said that Sam Brown was a great companion. They got along well. They were became very good friends, although Sam was killed very shortly after this. But uh, he said he could, couldn't say anything bad about Sam Brown. Um, and he tried to pay him back the $20 several times after that when he'd see him, and he wouldn't take the money. He did ask Haynes for $40. Uh, not too long before he was killed by Henry Van Sickle. Uh, he was a little down on his luck, and hey, Haynes was happy to give him the money. Um, let me see. By 
1860, the Comstock is really in full swing. Now he's got an 800, 8,000-acre 8, ranch in California. Hmm. They need meat in Virginia City, so he brought several herds of cattle to Virginia City, selling them immediately when he drove them into town to the local butchers and doubled his money, just like that. Doubled his money. So he always doubled his money, pretty much. Um, so um, that was sort of a, you know, good thing. That's kind of what I think the plan was with the sheep. But I think they were so run down, he probably figured he wasn't going to get that much money on the hoof. And so he took them and took them back to California. Um, about 1860, 1861, in the summer, he brought a herd of sheep up to Silver Lake. Uh, with a man named Duncan, and they pastured him there for the summer. And so they headed on into Nevada, and uh, he had some business in town, so he collected some money and, and things. And then about 1861, he opened a butcher shop in Carson City. Since all these people were buying meat, I think he thought, well, I'll open my own butcher shop. Didn't last very long. I don't think he was cut out to be a butcher either. He was more of a thinker. Uh, and so uh, during the, uh, in 1861, that's when the Paiute Indian War took place. And if you know anything about the Paiute Indian War, um, William Station, out in the sink, not too far from where he had camped, and where his man stayed with the sheep for a while that summer, um, the Williamses didn't treat the Indians very well. They raped their women, cheated them. Uh, finally, they raped the wrong women, and the Braves came into, into the station and killed them and burned it. So, of course, everybody's up in arms. They're going to go get the Indians. The Pioneer Indian War was one of the few wars the Indians won. Uh, everybody went out there by Pyramid Lake and pretty much massacred. Uh, he, was he, went, he was living in Carson at that time. He was dead set against it. He told them they were all insane. And he wasn't going to lift a gun against the Paiutes because they saved his life. And so and he thought the Williams had probably got what they deserved. So, uh, but he did have a bit of a problem. Um, they came into his shop, stole his shotgun and his horse to go off and fight the Indians, and he never got them back. So that kind of irritated him. Uh, he was sort of a man of principle, you might say. Um, so he sold the butcher shop about 1861, and then he drove another herd of sheep, pastured him up at Silver Lake, with a man named Duncan who had a few head. And so they left their sheep, came into the valley. He collected some money on selling the uh, butcher shop and some cattle. He had some debts owed on cattle. And Duncan, he went off and did some prospecting. prospecting. So on their way back, they stopped at a place called Job Station, or Moses Job Store, or what is today Moses Sheridan, to spend the night. And he heard that Moses Job wanted to sell. So he thought, hmm, I, maybe we'll make an offer or see what, what his price is. So. He asked Job, I understand you're interested in selling. And Job replied to him, you don't look like you could afford to buy. And he said, well, that's beside the point. What do you want? And so Job said, I have 800 acres. I want $10,000, uh, but I want 2,000 down within 20 days. And so he thought about it. Mm, I can do that. So they made a deal. And then Job said that he either wanted to be paid in cash in a year or in hay. And I think he had about 300, head, 300 tons of hay sitting there. So um, Hayne said, OK. So he headed back to Sacramento, got the money, came back. And Duncan said, hey, I want to be your partner. I'll, I'll run the ranch. You can stay in Sacramento. Worked out great. The next spring, um, they brought haying equipment over from Sacramento, and enough teams to do it and they cut over 400 tons of hay. Now, the Carson River route with the Immigrant Trail that went along the valley and then up the canyon uh, by Cables Lake had kind of fallen to the wayside because the new 
more important trail came through Lake Valley, Lake Tahoe, and came over Kingsbury Gray. And so, uh, and with the Comstock booming, um, there were on an average probably, not average, but it may be at the peak, 200, 200 teams of 12 to 16 mule teams coming back and forth every day, going to Virginia City and coming back. It's kind of hard to fathom in your mind, mm -hmm. 200 teams. Mm -hmm. But all the supplies they needed in Virginia City, there was no train yet, and they needed a way to get them there, and that was the best way. And that was a lot of machinery, uh, you know, food supplies, you name it, they were hauling it to Virginia City. So uh, he thought, hmm, sounds like a good place to move my hay. So he paid off. Joe and Hay, 300 tons, and he had about a little over 100 tons left. So he bought from John Carey, the land right where Kingsbury Grade opens up into the valley, where the, where the trains were coming. And so uh, he took his hay from Sheridan down to there, and made a quick buck really fast. Didn't take long to sell at 100 tons, nothing flat. So he said, oh, this is a pretty good operation. So he bought some more land from Kerry and began growing hay on that piece. So for several years, um, he uh, was growing hay and selling it, making a very good profit. Um, probably every year he was selling close to 800 tons of hay right there. Okay, the railroad is getting closer. Uh, he's thinking about this in the back of his mind because it's coming across the country, getting ready to meet. But 1863 sort of shows up uh, around the corner and uh, statehood was on the horizon. And so uh, he was one of the people who helped draft the first state constitution. First draft, People didn't like it so much, and so they didn't go for it. So in the fall, they tried it in the spring. Citizens weren't too, too gung-ho. So they tried it again in the fall. Congress passed an enabling act for them to organize. And so uh, they wrote another constitution, probably more liking. They learned their mistakes from their first attempt. and. Uh, before they presented it to the people, though, they, they elected people and they kind of had everything sort of planned. So if the people did accept it, then they were ready to go as a government. And so he was elected as a senator. The people went for it. And so he helped draft the first constitution for the state of Nevada. Now, he, he's kind of a little known character. I mean, people who know, I've heard, you hear his name, but you don't really know all the fingers this fella had. He, he was into everything. Um, so what happened is what they did is they drew straws at that first election. And some people would serve a two-year term and some people a four. So this way they figured that if anybody could change, they would still have experience in the overall government. So he got the short straw and he was elected for two years. And he ran again and was reelected. Uh, they did the, the first two years as they met annually. And then by the Constitution, they went to biannual meetings. So he was pretty busy for the first couple of years. Uh, in the meantime, kind of about the same time, a little earlier, he married again uh, in Sacramento, a girl named Ellen Marie Whitney. And I figured that I haven't been able to find a marriage document, but I figured they were married probably about 1861. And uh, she lived on the ranch there in uh, near Elk Grove. And um, they had two, two sons, James Edgar and Harry something, I can't remember Harry's name. Uh, and he moved them to Carson Valley in 1863. So he, it looks like he's, he's making this his permanent place of residence. He's you know, in the Constitution. He's diversing himself in California. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention <coughs> in California, he was one of the organizers of the California State Fair. He was on the board for many years, even after moving to Nevada. 
And a little known fact, the first California State Fair was in Dixon, California, a little town. And uh, of course, then eventually went to Sacramento. But he stayed involved in the Sacramento State Fair for many years. Um, let me see, what else do we do? Okay. By about 1867, he's making money hand over fist, you know, selling hay to these, these mule trains going back and forth. And he's figuring, okay, the railroad's almost here. I gotta think of something else to make money, because as soon as the railroad gets here, this traffic is gonna die. So that was about the time he came up with the idea of it for his flu. And everybody talk, knows about the bee flumes that ran through the mountains all over here. Well, actually, he was a real inventor. And so what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to pass around a couple pictures, because there weren't a lot of photographs I could show you of Mr. Haynes and uh, family. So this is Haynes, small man of stature, not very large. I'm thinking this was probably about 1885, 1890. What cities or towns uh, did they go to in Ohio? Yeah. Um, Osterville, yeah. Um, near the Great Lakes. That's where the family lived. And that's where he would go back when he went to visit. Uh, and um, he. Uh, location already. So he got the idea of inventing a flu that would come down the mountain, <coughs> this canyon, Dagger Creek ran down there, it was a pretty good rushing creek, timber on both sides, very sharp canyon. So he hired a bunch of guys to follow the wood and he did them into four foot block sections and he had them fall about six to eight thousand of wood. And he built his flume, which ended up his first flume was a square flume like this. And they began running the water and the log scan the flume didn't work very well. Um, kept jamming up. So he ended up having to have a bunch of people down both sides of the flume to keep the logs from jamming. So then he thought about it. And uh, by this time, Cutting of the wood, building the flume, um, he probably had about sixteen, fifteen, sixteen thousand dollars invested before he even tried to run it through the flume. Building the flume, paying all these people to cut the wood. Um, so he got to thinking about it. Okay, so then he invented what you would call a the V flume, which ended up being very successful. But what he did. The next time is he built the bee flume in his square flume, but he did it kind of like this. Okay, it's a bee like this, but he hooked, connected them this way where they overlapped. Okay, that didn't work too well either. Um, when the logs would get to where they're connected, they, the, the water would kind of swirl and stick them. So, uh, in the winter of 1869-1870, he tore out the whole thing, and then he did an abutting flu, where it was abutted like this, you know, it was a V, both sides, and so it was a smooth surface, and worked marvelously. And so, in a day, they could run four to five hundred cords of wood down that flu. Can you imagine what it looked like at the bottom every day? Um, then he, they had a creek. The Dagger Creek came out, went into the valley. He ran the wood into the river and transported it to Carson. He was beating everyone else's price by half or more. The, the consumer, the people buying it, the mines, people were getting firewood, the whole thing, he was selling his wood for half. Well, his wood was the most popular. Um, and so other people began adapting his idea. And he did file a patent. 
And here's a picture of his room on the back, and this is the patent on the front. I'll just kind of pass these around. Um, so you have kind of a better idea of what it looked like. Um, so I think the, the sorriest thing in his whole life was other people stole the idea and were making money with it. Now, he didn't care so much about being the inventor of the bee plume. He thought all those people that were using his patent or his idea should pay him. He was always really into making money. And uh, he took it all the way to the Supreme Court and lost. Mm -hmm. um, it, was, it was kind of something that all bugged him the whole rest of his life. He was never um, quite over that thing. Um, and years later, when you know people interviewed him or talked to him, he would always bring that up. So it was one of those things that he uh, was quite upset about. Um, I told you brought his wife and family over here. I would say sometime after 1870, they were divorced. And I can't find a divorce in either Nevada or California, but I know they were divorced. Um, his wife second wife, Ellen Marie Whitney, went back, left here and went to San Francisco. The boys, his two sons, ended up staying here. Uh, so he's you know, still going back and forth to Sacramento, still visiting with the Cables. Of course, they're on the Cables Lake during the summer, so he goes up there. Okay, he's, he's sort of well known for marrying much younger women, much younger. Ellen was maybe eight years younger. Well, his next wife was born to Dr. and Mrs. Cables when they reached California in 1851. James Wallace Haynes marries Rosa Emma Cables. So she is about almost 30 years younger than he is. Um, they were married in Elk Grove, where Dr. Cables had moved, and it was Thanksgiving, and I think it was 1874, they were married at the home of Dr. Cables. And I think um, Emma kind of stayed in Sacramento area while he was flitting around uh, over this way, and then um, he, uh, decided he was going to build her a home. He had another ranch that he purchased just outside of Chinoa. This is the house. It's a horrible picture, but honest to God, this is the only picture I could find around here of the house. You've seen it. It's all on the main road there in Chinoa. It's the little house with the little bay window. It sits real close to the road, and across Foothill Road or Main Street is a big barn. Right now they're jacking it up. That's the Haynes barn. The house was on this side of the street. The barn was on the other side of the street. So um, he's going to build Rosa a new house. So I've heard very many different stories about when this house was built. Most everybody says 1880. That's not true. And I know for a fact it's not true because I actually went to lunch a couple times with his great-great-granddaughter, uh, Betty Woodburn. Uh, she said that the house was being built. In the last few months, the house was being built. Her great-grandparents lived at the Kinsey house. And their first daughter, Maud Haynes, was born in the Kinsey house. And they were there two weeks before they moved into the new house. Mom was born in 1877. So that makes the house being built in 1877. Another little story about the house, if you're familiar with it, the house sits here, and then there's a little cottage next to it. Everybody thought the cottage was built for the Chinese cook. And he did have several Chinese cooks. But no, it was for the Capos family when they came to visit. Mm -hmm. And it cook sometimes stayed in there, or other people, other relatives, but it was mainly for her family when they came to visit. 
And so that's why the little cottage next to the house. Um, they had another child, Georgie, who was born probably two years after Maud. And he drowned in the Carson River when he was about nine. Mm -hmm. um, Haynes owned from where that barn is all the way down to the Carson River. And he also owned the Genoa Cemetery that he donated to the town. And he was kind of a very public spirited person. He got involved in everything. He belonged to, like, when he was in Sacramento, for example, he belonged to the Masons, the Odd Fellows, Fire Department, you know, I mean, he was a real joiner. So he kind of did the same here. Whatever was going on, he was a part of it. In fact, he had a place that was called his, kind of like his hall, where he had acts and things going on in town that he would bring in. Um, he was a staunch Republican. Um, when the Republican Party was formed, he was a Republican. Uh, he was the electoral vote from Nevada for President Grant when he ran for president. And um, he uh, was appointed by Grant to receive the meeting of the two railroads. So he was there for the drive, putting in the last rail and the driving of the spike at Promontory Point, Utah. And so uh, he was the government's representative. They had all these uh, fancy people from Sacramento, but Grant uh, appointed him as his representative. This is kind of hard to believe, huh? All this stuff from this little guy who was in Genoa. I mean, I'm sure most of you have never heard of any of this stuff, this guy doing all these things. So anyway, um, then about 1873, he was a staunch Republican, remember? A Democratic governor appointed him to the Centennial Commission, and he would go back to Philadelphia every year and help plan the elaborate fairs that we used to have, or expositions in those days. And he did that probably until about 1876 or so. Um, he remained, he was kind of a different sort of a cat. Okay, him and, and Henry Van Sickle got into a lawsuit over Daggett Creek. And, uh, Van Sickle figured he was entitled to a fourth. And Van Haynes, J.W. said, nah, it's all my water. So they went to court, took it to the state Supreme Court. Van Sickle won. A few years later, Van Sickle was mowing his hay. So apparently he didn't back a grudge over that. Uh, Van Sickle got his fourth of water. Uh, and then also mowed Haynes's hay, so you know things must have worked out okay between them. So I don't think he was a grudge packer. Um, so let me think. What else do I need to tell you? Um, for example, I told you he was a doer, a mover, and a shaker. 1877, he served on a trial jury, coroner's jury. Um, foreman of a district court jury. Uh, so he was a pretty busy fellow. Um, he had a stage line that ran from Silver Mountain. This is all in conjunction. All kinds of these things are all going on at the same time. Um, from Silver Mountain to Carson City, three this way, three this way, it operated six days a week. All the little towns in between, Monitor, Bullion, whatever. Um, he had partners in that business. He had lots of partners. And I have to say, most of the dealings all ended up pretty well. Like Duncan, who was a partner with him on the Moses Joe, ended up buying the ranch out from under him. And he only had to buy half when, when Haynes said, you know, we're going to be partners, you're going to run it. And so he only charged him for his half. Um, so he, he was pretty square. Um, he also was uh, elected president of the Nevada California Telegraph Company. Uh, A.C. Pratt, Carson Valley News editor, was the superintendent. They were good friends. They went all over running telegraph lines and visiting their different establishments along the way. 
Um, he had several little other businesses that I knew nothing about that were advertised. I found them in San Francisco, in directories in San Francisco. He and S.A. Kinsey were partners in some kind of gasoline business. J.R. Johnson, the local merchant in Genoa, they were very good friends and they had several little businesses going on. It says Genoa, you know, but I really didn't find anything in any newspapers around here, but they were advertising in San Francisco. So Stephen Kinsey and J.R. Johnson remained his lifelong friends. Um, they all pretty much died about the same time, within a few years of each other. Um, but they uh, remained friends for a very long time. Okay, okay, one of the most interesting things, I think, he'd been senator elected several times. November election of 1878. H.F. Daneberg is running against him. Mr. Daneberg wins by two votes. <laughs> J.W. requests a recount. It was denied. H.F. Uh, took the oath on January 6, 1879 to February 7, 1879. J.W. contested the election of Daneberg J.W. was declared to have received the majority of legal votes by the Nevada Senate. On February 7, 1879, the Senate voted 18 to 6 to see Haynes. J.W. took the oath of office on the 10th of February, 1879. So H.F. Dangberg was only a senator for a very short time. He did hold the position later. Um, by about 1885, J.W. is slowing down. He's getting older, he diverses himself and follows his business interests here in Carson Valley, except for his ranch in Genoa. But he goes on a little trip <coughs> to Northern California, Oregon, and Washington, where, a few years later, he owns several thousand acres of redwood timber. That's where the majority of his later, I mean, this man has made several fortunes. Sacramento, he made fortunes on mercantile restaurants. He made fortunes on big ranches in California. He made fortune on hay. He made a fortune on wood. He never seemed to ever, plus he had all these little other businesses running on the side. Uh, it was kind of him and Monroe's were partners in building a bridge. Um, he rented and sold the pile driver that he owned to the county to build a bridge. I mean, he was just all over the place. He had mining interests. Um, but by 1885, he kind of slowed down. And you got to remember, he's got a young wife. So they went to San Francisco and Elk Grove a lot. And her parents came here a lot. And then he died in October of 1900. Okay, almost every genealogy you read, no one knows where he's buried. He was buried in Genoa. So was Georgie. Rosa, after he died in 1900, her and Maude continued to live in Genoa for a while. Then Maude met Eugene Howell, who was Secretary of State of Nevada, and became the bank examiner. And Eugene had business in Tonopah with the banks. And so Rosa, Haynes' wife, went down and stayed with them in Tonopah. And then eventually they ended up back in Reno. And so she sold everything here. And she really didn't like Genoa that much after Georgie was drowned. It was a very disturbing thing to her. So I think after JW passed away, she couldn't wait to get out of town. Uh, and so she sold the ranch and uh, lived pretty close to Maud and, uh, in Reno and traveled quite a bit. They uh, did you know, a few little tours here and there. Um, nothing really extravagant, though. They were very conservative. The only thing is Haynes is a great, great job. Granddaughter Betty married Mr. Woodburn, who was a Democratic district attorney from Virginia City. Now, J.W. probably did flips in his grave because he was a staunch Republican, and probably that would have bothered him. Um, he was also, for that 
some of the things he did in Nevada. He also helped organize the Nevada State Fair, and he was on the UNR Board of Regents. Um, his house, after she sold it, was used for a few things. I think a few divorced stars lived there. And then I think one of the most interesting people that lived there was Guilford Ralston. Mr. Ralston uh, owned the Haynes house probably in the 1970s through maybe mid-80s. He was a radio and Hollywood TV producer and screenwriter in the 1950s and 60s. He wrote for General Electric Theater, Procter Gamble radio program. Um, he helped write The Road to Morocco with Edward R. Morrow. He created the TV series Wild Wild West. He created it. He also did scripts for Star Trek, the original. Gunsmoke, Ben Casey, I Spy, Hawaii Five-O, Naked City, Big Valley, Marcus Bowlby, M.D. Um, he wrote the screenplay for the 1971 hit movie Willard and Ben. He also wrote five book, a five-book series called Dakota. Uh, he was one of the founders of Sierra Nevada College up at Incline, and he was in the college school in Reno. He lived in Genoa. He was a diabetic. And massages made his diabetes feel better, so he created this school. He tried to start a community college in Carson City. Several other places, there were about him and three other guys that kept doing this, and they finally got it to take an incline. Um, when the movie Wild Wild West came out in the 1990s, he was living, I think, in South Carolina. He sued Warner Brothers because he was the original screenwriter and originated the story. He died before he got his money, but his family got the money because he passed away in 1999. Shortly thereafter, Warner Brothers settled with the family for an undisclosed amount. <laughs> so I would say it was probably over a million. Um, so that's kind of the story of J.W. Uh, you know, <laughs> He looks like such a tiny little person, uh, not very strong, but he had to have a will of steel to do all the things. And I thought what was really interesting about him, he was always just a step ahead of everybody else. I mean, he, he figured it out. Aha, railroad's coming. Hay business isn't going to be very good. Go into the wood business. Um, redwood forests in California are going to be bigger money. In Oregon than, than here. And those those redwood forests sustained the family for many years. Uh, a lot of these things the average person doesn't know because I don't know what I wrote something years ago and Nan Spina, his great great granddaughter, contacted me and she had me come for a couple luncheons with her great grandmother. Uh, we went to Adele's. Uh, I took a tape recorder. And we didn't want Granny to know we were taping, so Nan and I would meet early, and the rest of the family would bring Granny. And Granny was pretty outspoken, and she couldn't pull the wool too much over her eyes. And so I put the tape recorder under the table and taped a lot of the conversations, and that's how I learned about them living at the Kinsey house, being lifelong friends with the Kinseys, being very good friends with J.R. Johnson, um, how Rosa was so upset about Georgie drowning, and she really didn't care for Genoa anymore. Why she moved the bodies to Reno. Um, there's a very nice plot in the Genoa Cemetery. This is still the Haynes plot. There's nobody on it. It's got nice steps. Um, but there's nobody there. They're all in Reno. Um, the uh, uh, family still lives in the area. There's many of them that live in Reno. Um, some live in Las Vegas, some live in California, but there's quite a large number of them that are still about around, if you know, the Lawfer, Woodburn, Woodburn, Woodburn. <laughs> that was the Woodburn that married the great granddaughter. And I one of the little younger kids that came to lunch with us one day, uh, I said, well, are you going to be a lawyer too? He said, God, not on your life. We have too many lawyers in our family. <laughs> he said, I'm going to be an engineer, garbage collector. I don't know, but I'm not being a lawyer. <laughs> so, uh, so that's kind of how I learned some of this stuff. And the other was research. 
about Mr. A. I thought he was a fascinating man. I really didn't know that much about him until they began telling me all the things he did. He was just J.W. Oh, well. you know, but he was quite a character. So any questions? Yes. Are there any descendants from his two sons? Yes. And so there are actual Haynes still? Mm -hmm. uh, some live in the San Francisco Bay Area, and the one son, James Edgar, moved to Las Cruz, New Mexico. Oh, then he has descendants there. Now, I will tell you this. I don't see any of the family here, so I can. <laughs> so, I was told that the second wife, the reason they were divorced, is she was a drinker. And um, the kids, the boys stayed, they were here on the 1880 census, living with Rosa, the third wife, and, and J.W. Um, I don't know that they got to share in the large amount of money much later because Granny went to have lunch that one of them came to see her and she said they were just after money. <laughs> so, uh, so I don't think they got quite the amount of money. Um, the second wife, Ellen uh, Marie Whitney, she died by 1883 in San Francisco. So uh, she died pretty young. Uh, so, you know, maybe they did what they were saying about the alcoholism might be true. Um, and so, because that's kind of young. She probably would have been um, in the early 40s. So, uh, but she moved to San Francisco and died there. One son, Harry, was in San Francisco. James Edgar was in New Mexico, and they both have descendants. Uh, you know, the four, one of the places he really showed foresight was on the uh, telegraph company that you mentioned, where he and A.C. Pratt, uh, he saw that Bodie was going to be what it was going to be, so he ran a telegraph line to Bodie, and so if you wanted to get a telegraphic message out of Bodie, it had to go to Genoa and there tap into the transcontinental telegraph. So he, he had that vision all of the time. Yeah, I mean, he was just, I think, an amazing fellow to be that. He didn't have a great education. I don't even think he went to college. Probably didn't even finish high school. Um, but to be able to anticipate, I mean, there are people that are like that, that have a vision and are at the right place at the right time. But he was able to anticipate what the next big thing was going to be and was always on the ground floor. I mean, always. And I will say, there aren't too many lawsuits, a few people sued him. But generally, people that he was partners with, like Mr. Lyon in Sacramento, Mr. Webster, uh, they all ended up being amicable friends. And, and usually what he would do is when he got tired of that business, he would sell them his share. And he probably sold it for a reasonable fee. You know, what it, was, what it was worth, but he didn't try to take too much advantage of it. So I think he was a kind of a really interesting fellow. And we really know very little about him. So he was born in Ohio, not uh, Canada? No, he was born in Canada. He went to, born in 1826, went to Ohio. Born in Canada in 1826, the family moved to Ohio in 1830. And where in Ohio did they move? Um, up kind of by the Great Lakes uh, area. So, and that's where the Cables family, a lot of his partners were from Ohio. So I often wonder if they weren't on the same wagon train coming west. You know, possibly, because it was a train that, that started out. Now, one of the things I read that said that he was the captain of the wagon train, but I have found no proof of that. I mean, that's always good for us. family story. Oh, great grandpa was the captain of the wagon train that came west. He could have been. I just could, could probably was. He was always kind of leading things and being in charge. Um, but I couldn't find any real evidence of that. Um, since he was in this area during the Comstock period there, did you research your real Oh yeah, he owned a little bit here, and a little bit there, and a little bit there. But I don't think he was a gambler. That was kind of a gamble. He was more of an investor on a sure thing. And he, you know, he, he could kind of 
figure out, okay, this is going to cost me this much to build, and I plan to make this much off of it. These cows are going to cost me this much. I'm probably going to be able to get this much when I sell them. The hay is costing me this much to put up. I can sell it for this much. He knew mining was a gamble. Uh, you know, he invested likely here and there, but I don't think he put his eggs too heavily in that basket. He wanted a sure thing. And really, I mean, mines in those days, the people who were making the money were the people that owned the stock. It wasn't the miner, and it wasn't the guy that owned the mine. It was the stock manipulation that uh, the money was made on. So I think he probably bought a few shares here and there, but I don't think he invested too heavily. Uh, and that way he wanted to sure thing. So anyway, that's it. Thank you. Thank you.